Hello, everybody, and welcome again to the World Energy Week Live. And thank you for joining this session, The Role of Hydrogen as a Clean Energy Vector. Thank you so much to the World Energy Council for organizing a special session on hydrogen. And I believe during this one hour session, we will manage to convince you together with the speakers of this panel that it is indeed an extremely important and relevant topic for the whole decarbonization agenda. My name is Tatiana Mitreva. I'm director at Skolkova Business School Energy Center. And it's my pleasure and honor to moderate this session today. And we have an amazing group of people, fantastic speakers who joined us today uh, and who will navigate you through this whole quite complicated and really sometimes controversial hydrogen environment. So first of all, I would like to introduce Emmanuel Kakaras, Vice President and Head of Innovations and New Products at Mitsubishi Hitachi Power System Europe. Alan Finkel, uh, Australia's chief scientist and Australian government and executive officer at National Science and Technology Council. Hello, Alan. Uh, Alona Farger, principal at Swan Capital Partners and also future energy leader. Welcome to our panel. Karsten Roll, head of department at en on energy and climate policy in the Federation of German uh, Industries and also secretary general of the German member committee of the World Energy Council. Hello, Karsten. And of course, last but not least, Shigeru Muraki, uh, whom I'm sure most of you know, vice chair for Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia and executive advisor of the World Energy Council and also Tokyo Gas Company. So welcome on board, everybody. I hope we will have a vivid and interesting discussion today, especially as this whole topic on hydrogen, uh, it is becoming very hot. And uh, there are nearly uh, every day we hear news from different parts of the world on the new national hydrogen strategies, which are being published, on the new hydrogen projects, which are launched domestically or between different countries, uh, on the new technologies that are advancing, on the new ideas which are under discussion. And at the same time, we see a lot of question marks which are still left which color of hydrogen is a good color, uh, how to build business models and where can the companies earn money in this whole hydrogen supply chain, how to certify that the hydrogen is indeed green enough uh, and decarbonized enough, and many, many other technical, regulatory, economic issues uh, which really make uh, this whole hydrogen topic a sort of a puzzle, uh, which we will try maybe not to solve during this one hour session, but at least to approach. Uh, and uh, we will start with a short statements, uh, opening remarks from our session participants. And first of all, I would suggest to start from the consumer side, because at the end of the day, it is the client who is the king and who is defining uh, the demand and uh, the whole uh, development of the energy market. And of course, uh, power generation is probably the most interesting segment currently. So I would start uh, with asking Emmanuel Kakaras uh, to give, to share his perspective, uh, first of all, on the uh, power uh, sector development and the role of hydrogen and power, but also on the whole global hydrogen supply chain. So Emmanuel, please, the floor is yours. Much, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you very much uh, for having us uh, as Mitsubishi Heavy Industries invited in this panel. I'm extremely glad to present industry's views on hydrogen. And I'm, I'm extremely glad to do that for two reasons. One is my longstanding background on the power sector, but also uh, having spent time in academia for 25 years, it's a kind of dream coming through when being able to discuss uh, with you about hydrogen. So uh, first of all, everybody's agreed that uh, uh, we, are, we don't have to discuss, but we have to realize the hydrogen policy. It's a common understanding that hydrogen is the enabler 
towards the zero carbon. And uh, as I used to say, we have to uh, draw our uh, strategies based on past failures because uh, hydrogen is not here for the first time. But it is the first time that we have the combination of two. We have the need, uh, the societal need for decarbonization and the need for energy storage that power the use of uh, hydrogen in the energy sector. So yes, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, the power as a consumer, but I think that uh, equally uh, power stands also in the production side of hydrogen. If we're talking on uh, green hydrogen, it's uh, the electrolyzer, so the, the big consumer of electricity that is there to produce hydrogen at carbon free uh, and uh, enable uh, the uh, increased uh, introduction of renewable sources. So we have uh, power in both ends of the value chain. And in fact, uh, this is what, uh, what's about hydrogen. Hydrogen is a complete value chain linking production. That means green or blue hydrogen. I think that we are going to uh, talk about that in the, the future. Distribution and transmission and end use. So uh, in order to put there a complete value chain, you have to create the demand for hydrogen. And this is the, uh, where the economics of power production, which generally uh, are, are not favoring uh, a very expensive fuel, because today hydrogen is more expensive than conventional fuel, no question about that. Uh, but power offers the single point of consumption the consumption of uh, large quantities of hydrogen, which enables the creation of a whole infrastructure. And this is what has been under, uh, understood and accepted uh, cross across the globe. Uh, we have announcements on projects in the US. We have announcement of similar projects in, the, uh, in Europe about the hydrogen use at the power sector. And we think that this is a very healthy sign of the uh, industry that goes uh, ahead to make it happen, because the point here is to make it happen. And of course, across the value chain, uh, all major industrial players are trying to put the, puzzle, the pieces of the, of the puzzle and uh, to place themselves across the value chain with technology which promotes the zero emission power production at the end and the zero emission power consumption at the, at the beginning. And in between, we have the decarbonization challenges. We have blue hydrogen, which is an enabler towards, uh, and for uh, once no familiar, blue means carbon-free hydrogen, uh, uh, which is an enabler to go to the uh, big uh, numbers of consumption and production of green hydrogen. And then, of course, in between, we have the bridging of sectors, the sectoral coupling that uh, enables not to think uh, as we classically do in the power sector in this silo mode, but we have to think in what we call sector coupling and uh, bridge the transport sector with clean and zero carbon fuels or the industrial sector with the power sector and uh, because at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is to reach decarbonization targets the soonest possible. And that's a very healthy point, as I, I told you. And uh, in, from that point, we uh, very much support even more aggressive targets than the ones set by the politicians. And the, the sector I'm working for has brought up uh, from all OEMs technology much earlier than anticipated, because we feel that uh, society is committed and the market will follow to make business cases along these uh, technologies. I think that's enough to start with, and uh, we can discuss more at the end. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you for these great points and also for building the bridge of, to my uh, question uh, for Alan. Uh, you were talking about, uh, first of all, the power sector, but you've also mentioned that hydrogen is indeed uh, a unique uh, universal uh, energy carrier. So, Alan, I want to address you the question on the other sectors other than power. Uh, how do you see the role of hydrogen uh, generally? 
but also what are you doing there in Australia in expanding this role of hydrogen in the different sectors of the economy? Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Look, the idea of using hydrogen to fuel the ships that plough the oceans and power the factories that make, that make the goods that we purchase, it's old, it's, it's really old. It was beautifully articulated by the science fiction writer Jules Verne in a novel published 150 years ago. But since then, the idea, it's come and it's gone. Hydrogen bubbles, just like internet bubbles. But eventually, the internet made it, and it made it big time. And this time around, clean hydrogen will make it big time. The stars are aligned. We saw Japan make an enormous commitment two years ago. And just this year, we've seen massive multi-billion dollar commitments from Germany, from France, from Spain, and others. Now, my country, Australia, we now have a national hydrogen strategy, which is stimulating significant funding from government and from private investors. So there are two driving factors this time round. First, the globally accepted need to massively reduce emissions. And second, the stunning reduction in the price of renewable electricity, which is the biggest input cost to making renewable hydrogen. Now, it's worth noting that nearly three quarters of global emissions come from energy use. Civilization needs energy, lots of it. Without energy, it's back to the Stone Age. But energy resources are not equally distributed among countries. So there will always be a need to trade energy. But if that energy in future is solar and wind electricity, trading it is not as easy as putting oil into a massive tanker ship. For short distances, high voltage surface or, or undersea cables, cables will do it. But what is the solution for long distances? It's hydrogen. To address the tyranny of distance and to eliminate single supplier dependencies, hydrogen is the ideal way to package up the electrons for international shipping. I was very fortunate. I was at the launch of the world's first large scale liquid hydrogen carrier ship last year in Japan. And as I watched that giant vessel slide down the rails into the water, I was overwhelmed, not just by its size and not just by the fact that it was the first of its kind. I was mostly overwhelmed by the fact that I was witnessing the dawn of a new era for humankind in which we will be able to ship renewable energy between the continents at massive scale. Hydrogen alone will not enable us to eliminate emissions from energy use and industrial production. But clean hydrogen in partnership with clean electrons will take us most of the way to eliminating carbon dioxide emissions globally without requiring that we abandon our way of life nor the growth in our economies. At an atomic level, hydrogen is made from electrons and protons. Together, hydrogen and electrons will deliver the solution we need to combat climate change. May the force be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you for this very inspiring message. And it really looks sometimes like a science fiction, but at the same time, you are the person who witnessed this tanker to be built. And uh, that shows us that the dreams are really uh, beginning to come true. Uh, but actually, I want to turn now to Alona. And Alan was talking about the Australia's government uh, strategy and uh, actually finance allocation for this strategy. So uh, from the financial perspective, do you think that this whole hydrogen story could develop only on the massive state financing? Or can the private investors, can the financial market also step in and see some value and some potential revenues and profits there? Dear Tatiana, dear colleagues, dear online participants, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Tatiana, for this question. 
I think we all agree here that hydrogen is a marvelous solution to enable energy transition, both on the decarbonization of the energy product, uh, production and the electrification of fire news. As Alan highlighted, transitioning this energy in a low carbon mode between different sectors and areas. So my name is Alena and uh, I would like to bring my investor perspective and uh, let us develop a little bit uh, about uh, financial challenges. Indeed, today, uh, the stars, uh, hydrogen stars starting to align. Uh, we have this uh, social and policy confidence and um, about uh, need for a global uh, decarbonization. Uh, we have policies in different countries announcing um, decarbonization plans, including specified plans for hydrogen. Um, I would, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm based in France and I'm running a first European investment fund dedicated uh, to renewable gases, biogas and hydrogen. And I was extremely uh, happy to, um, to follow on the announcements of the French government early in September, announcing 7 billion uh, hydrogen plan. Half of it uh, will be dedicated uh, to uh, the production of the hydrogen uh, in three years from now. Um, from private, well, private investors are there to uh, to build and to support uh, this uh, financing of hydrogen, which uh, may bring um, the hydrogen technology in this virtual vir virtuous circle of the cost reduction, both through economy of scale and learning by doing effects. So the challenges I see right now is to allow emerging of large scale projects. Uh, which will trigger the cost cost reduction. If you follow to some recent reports, uh, for example, the one published by the Hydrogen Council, um, the uh, production cost for clean hydrogen is expected to cut its cost by two, mainly by um, renewables being available uh, at the large scale and at the lower cost, and also uh, thanks to the um, cost reduction uh, due to scale manufacturing of electrolysis equipment. Uh, so in France, uh, the plan announced by the government, it may be a little early to see the, um, the consequences today as far as it was announced last month. However, what I really like about the plan is that a half of, um, there is a very nice um, policy intention to uh, compensate the difference between clean hydrogen and gray hydrogen for the final consumer. To, uh, so to, to, to build on what Emmanuel Speck uh, told us, um, the final consumer won't be uh, obliged in a way to pay this green premium to go green. So for the first um, deployment stages, the government will be able to compensate this green premium. And so el el enabling the consumer to purchase clean hydrogen at uh, the cost of the gray one. And I do believe that will unlock uh, some of the good projects, especially uh, from the offtake um, offtakes agreement, because a good project, uh, like I say, financial project from the investor perspective, is the project which has a secured offtake uh, and good uh, PPAs in uh, for the energy renewable energy um, consumption at the, at the entrance. Uh, to make this uh, long story short, um, I do believe and I do hope to see more good hydrogen projects back from the offtake side, thanks to the government support at the very first stages of the deployment, which allows final consumers to purchase clean hydrogen at the reasonable cost. And on the other side, uh, I do believe that there is no uh, reason uh, the renewable integration will slow down and uh, the renewables making uh, their path to the uh, even deeper uh, cost reduction will uh, bring also clean hydrogen produces this energy uh, more competitive and more available. Thank you, Alona. Thank you for all these points. And uh, actually, I want to turn now to Karsten. Uh, Alona was mentioning uh, both this uh, effect of scaling up hydrogen projects and also all these regulatory incentives which could help to expand the market. Uh, so I know you've made an amazing study which summarizes uh, the results of all the international hydrogen strategies. So could you please share uh, the main messages of what is happening with these hydrogen strategies around the world and what are the major challenges and question marks? 
Hi, uh, thank you very much, Tatiana, for the kind introduction. In fact, one of the key topics of the conferences of the last month I attended was always hydrogen as a talking point. Uh, and many people ask me, is that now a second hype, uh, as we saw it uh, just two decades ago, or is that something new in it? And as Alan said, uh, we believe there is something new, and that's why we did this little study work. Um, what's going on globally and officially uh, in the hydrogen world? What governments actually have formulated official hydrogen strategies, and by that giving the topic an additional governmental commitment? Uh, that was the key question driving us. And um, we found out, asking 56 countries, that nine countries by now have such an official hydrogen strategy, and another 11 countries are just about preparing one, including Russia, that are taking these uh, next days about to publish it. So roughly 20 countries, governments are really dealing with the topic uh, very much in depth. Of course, these strategies differ. Uh, in the level of detail, in the focus areas, most of them would look very much on the uh, transport sector and the uh, manufacturing industry sector in the first place, and a little less than on the housing sector and the uh, energy sector. But that differs a bit uh, also by continents. Asia it does include the residential sector more than Europeans do, uh, for instance. And same is true for the motivation. Um, of course, uh, climate neutrality is giving the hydrogen issue an additional push. We all know that for the past years, uh, like with an iceberg, we've looked on the 20% electrons that are very well visible and have a little bit forgotten the 80% of the molecules beyond the surface. Uh, and uh, with climate neutrality really being articulated as an official governmental target for many countries, continents, uh, the European Union, this is now, of course, a different story. But next to that, also the opportunities on the technological side, so the growth pros prospects do play a role and are a motivation for several countries to do so. Nevertheless, that's on the good part. Um, there's a long way to go. Um, as we see also in the strategies, uh, not enough uh, concrete action really when it comes to bringing uh, the demand into place, as has been mentioned. So concrete policy instruments are still needed, especially when it comes to OPEX. So the running costs uh, in on the demand side are crucial and still are far away from what we can uh, find on the markets. So we will see and need more government action on implementing CO2 prices, subsidy schemes, also for longer term which has uh, correlations with uh, state aid legislation, other issues, quota, all of these will be needed for quite some time to bring hydrogen and its derivatives to the markets. Um, otherwise, we will still will have to wait. And that's nothing we can really do in climate terms. Thank you. Thank you, Carsten. Thank you so much. And uh, now I want to turn to Muraki-san, who was waiting patiently. Thank you so much for uh, joining us at this panel. Could you please share your expertise and knowledge on, first of all, what is happening with hydrogen in Asia? And in particular, one question which was not raised so far during the previous discussion, the most costly and challenging part of the whole supply chain transportation of hydrogen. We know that hydrogen has been used globally for decades uh, in the industrial use. It was mainly gray hydrogen. Uh, and I, I think it's like 80 million tons per annum globally. But there was always negligible amount of mm. hydrogen which was crossing the borders. And now when we want to build up global hydrogen market, transportation is really becoming a real constraint and challenge. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Tatiana. And uh, the, in Asia and the Pacific, uh, Several countries are now working on the hydrogen strategy. Of course, and Australia is moving ahead, and New Zealand, Japan, Korea is now moving, and China is, is preparing, and Singapore is preparing. So hydrogen becomes uh, one of the uh, key topics of the innovations uh, now. But uh, this time, 
I will talk uh, representing the, the Green Ammonia Consortium in Japan. Uh, of course, and the hydrogen will take an important role to develop the renewable energy extensively and globally. Hydrogen can be stored and transported to the wide range of the energy market to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions extensively. But many, many renewable uh, rich countries are far from the major market. Uh, so transportation is a key as uh, Tatiana mentioned. A uh, typical example is in Australia. The tran to transport renewable hydrogen from Australia to Japan and the Asian markets uh, economically and efficiently, and we are developing the technologies uh, for the liquid hydrogen energy carriers, such as ammonia, liquid hydrogen, and chemical hydride. Among those uh, carriers, ammonia is the cheapest and most viable mechanism which was indicated in the hydrogen uh, IEA report of the hydrogen future uh, last year. And the bigger advantages of the ammonia are the ammonia has been commercially traded in a chemical and fertilizer market, and ammonia can be combusted directly without the carbon dioxide emissions in an energy market, such as coal boilers, gas turbines, uh, solid oxide fuel cells, industrial furnaces, and marine engines, hydrogen ammonia for marine engines, like uh, Alan mentioned. And in Japan, we have been developing the, those uh, direct combustion technologies, and some of those technologies are ready for the commercial use, and other technologies will be commercialized by 2030. And our feasibility study of the blue ammonia supply from US to Japan using natural gas and EOR shows $2 per kilogram hydrogen equivalent price. So we are now planning the implementation of the fuel ammonia value chain uh, with the blue and green ammonia supplies from Australia US, Canada, and Middle East. We are targeting start the commercial use of fuel ammonia in 2025 to 2026 in five to six years for mixed combustion in coal power plant at the beginning, and then expand to gas turbines, industrial furnaces, and marine engines through 2030. The scalable demand of the ammonia can enhance the cost reduction of the renewable hydrogen production and can be utilized uh, in a different market by different carriers and different transportation methods. But ammonia uh, will be a realistic option for the carbon-free fuels uh, in the energy market and potential game changer in the energy market or energy supply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Muraki san So now we are moving to the Q&A part, and I will ask all the speakers, I will ask short questions, you will try to give uh, brief answers, okay? And uh, I will start uh, with Emmanuel, you were the first uh, with your speech, you will be the first with the, uh, these questions. So uh, you were talking about the role of hydrogen in the power sector. Uh, but it seems to be an extremely expensive option. So what is your vision? Should hydrogen, will be, uh, should hydrogen be first of all deployed uh, in the uh, electricity generation or in the other applications? And also the second part of the question, green and blue hydrogen was mentioned already today. Uh, what is the relationship and what should be uh, the balance between green and blue? Okay, this, this is anything but a short question, but anyway, Tatiana, uh, first of all, who, who said that uh, hydrogen is expensive for power? If I, you have to measure it as an energy storage vector and hydrogen for energy storage, and especially if I'm counting a long-term energy storage, not cycling storage, hydrogen is the most cost-effective way. 
So when you uh, compare or you allocate cost into something, we have to have the product. The product of the hydrogen use in the power sector is energy storage, is an interruptible supply. It's carbon free energy storage around the clock, every day, seven days a week, and so on. In that context, already today, hydrogen competes, uh, I think, uh, quite easily with all other storage technologies in the market. And this is the reason why industries are moving and power companies are moving ahead to the uh, energy or, or the use of hydrogen. Now to the second part of the question. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm lecturing also to the university and I'm answering this question like that. Uh, the color of hydrogen does not matter as long as it is carbon free. And thank God we have an established methodology uh, thanks to the RED2 a directive that has been already in place in the European Union, and we can count down all the remaining or the trace emissions of CO2 along the value chain of hydrogen production. And to me, uh, blue or green is the same as long as it is carbon free. President Teng in China said every, the color of the cut is not significant as long as mouse is caught. That means uh, we see that uh, blue hydrogen has a cost competitiveness because we do not have for the time being such a big amount of cheap renewable uh, electricity. In places like Australia, the gap is decreasing. Australia itself uh, demonstrates both options in the supply, uh, hydrogen supply. So for us, blue competitiveness paves the way to green, which will, at the end of the day will be the dominant technology. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Alan, I will turn to you. Uh, you were uh, actually one of the key question is how do we build demand for hydrogen? So there is an obvious imbalance between all these massive and diverse production plants and the demand side. So how do we build demand for hydrogen? Uh, Tatiana, that is the biggest and most important question, in my opinion, and the answer is very difficult. Uh, I have been seeing investors very enthusiastically in Australia want to invest in production of hydrogen, and I'm sure that we can get to very cost-effective production of renewable hydrogen or even fossil fuel hydrogen with CCS if the demand is there. So I think the demand bill will be different in every country. In Australia, um, given that we have an abundance of renewable electricity, we don't really need, we don't see hydrogen having a significant role in the electricity supply, uh, domestic supply. But we also use a lot of hydrogen, a lot of natural gas for heating our houses and our commercial buildings. And there's a lot of, there are a number of projects in Australia now to replace the methane, the natural gas in the distribution network, initially with 10% hydrogen by volume. And if we were to do that, we would be installing, uh, you know, several gigawatts of electrolysis capability in the coming decade, uh, given that the world supply of electrolysis electrolyzers is only in the hundreds of megawatts, that's quite a lot of capacity through which we will get experience and reduce the cost of production. In countries like Japan, if I may speak for them, um, clearly in order for them to reduce their emissions, they have to take fossil fuels out of their input, uh, import supply chain. And so using hydrogen for power production, when I say hydrogen, I include its derivatives such as ammonia. So using hydrogen or its derivatives for power generation in Japan makes a lot of sense and for transport in Japan. So my short answer is it's very country dependent. In Germany, it's going to be involved in industry, in Sweden, in steel making. Um, it's got enormous potential but it'll take time. It'll probably be 10 or 15 years before the world's steel making factories start to convert to zero emission steel made with hydrogen and renewable electricity. The, bit, the more we can accelerate the demand growth, the faster we will reduce costs and increase demand growth. Again, it's a chicken and egg situation at the moment. It's a very big chicken called supply and a very small egg called demand. 
Thank you, Alan. One follow-up question from Carlos Gali. What do you think will be the potential of hydrogen for the mining industry? To me, in Australia? That Good. question to me? Yep. Uh, uh, enormous, enormous. So in Australia, um, our mining industry is a huge consumer of diesel fuel because they need a lot of energy, hundreds of kilometres from anywhere that you'd normally call civilization, And so they, it's very expensive for them to get the diesel fuel there. And of course, it's high emissions. They're concerned about their emissions. They're concerned about their costs. So they see the opportunity to build significant microgrids, you know, 100 megawatt microgrids using solar electricity and wind electricity uh, to produce the hydrogen that they would use to power the mining equipment, the trucks, and to produce hydrogen for long-term seasonal storage. And they'll use battery storage, of course, for the daily cycle of solar. So we see enormous potential for solar, wind, and hydrogen in the mining sites to replace the vast consumption of diesel fuel at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Alena, I will turn to you and ask probably the most painful question uh, on the economics of the hydrogen projects, uh, which is currently not that uh, fantastic uh, to uh, really make investors happy. So uh, could you pl please give if there are any uh, attractive examples of the practical business cases for investing in hydrogen. Uh, and also maybe you have some thoughts, where does the profit lie today? Or is it a non-profit business, just uh, a startup, uh, just a global startup, which will start to bring profits and dividends in 10 or 15 year time? What do you think about that? Hey, Tatiana, no worries. No, no pain, no gain. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm a hydrogen investor. So I'm running currently an investment fund. It's not a philanthropic fund. It's an investment impact fund, a SWAN impact fund for transition uh, with 175 million available today to be invested in biogas and hydrogen infrastructure projects. So um, you, you know my uh, industrial story and my long-term passion uh, for hydrogen to enabling the energy transition. So you can imagine I'm screening uh, really um, very attentively uh, first uh, hydrogen infrastructure projects uh, in Europe uh, to, be, to, to be supported with, uh, with my fund. I do believe and uh, well, my economic models and <laughs> community of experts agreed that indeed today, uh, the financial case for hydrogen may be challenging. However, in mid and long term, uh, the profitability is there. The uh, main, um, let us say, main uh, enablers for this economic profitability on the top of the environmental contribution of hydrogen to the energy transition is the policy support at the initial stages of the development of technologies. And we see it, we see it all across the globe, all those ambitious plans announced by France, I uh, talked about, announced by Germany, maybe so sometime soon from UK, uh, in Japan, we see it all across the, lo the globe, the policy side and uh, social side for, for the support of, of the hydrogen is there. So the challenge is uh, how to uh, make those cases profitable, uh, not in, uh, in, 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 in two days, but, uh, day, but tomorrow, let us say. Um, so there are several, uh, several niches, uh, which I already see first uh, commercial projects in hydrogen production distribution space emerge. First of all, uh, those are um, industrial applications for hydrogen uh, in the industries which already use gray hydrogen for their, uh, for their industrial processes and which are obliged in a way to decarbonize, uh, well, encouraged and sometimes yeah, constrained to decarbonize quite rapidly uh, their processes by Europe, well, in Europe by, for example, European Directive for Renewable Energy, uh, Renewable Energy Directive. So in these cases, let us say um, the industrial actors know that the final uh, objective is to decarbonize and they start to compare different decarbonization options among them. Indeed, then you compare carbon-based options with a clean option. Of course, in very many cases, the uh, carbon-based option is at the very least of its cost reduction pathways and more financially attractive. 
However, when you extend a little bit and reframe the question saying, look, you have no choice but to decarbonize, please start compare apples with apples, start to compare different decarbonization options among them. So in these cases, I see already uh, some um, hydrogen uh, projects being um, like financially interested to, to invest in. Of course, it's early days. However, let us start with small steps and then run to tomorrow. Um, another, another, another side and another uh, sector where I can see and I can witness some of uh, hydrogen infrastructure projects I, I may be interested to finance are in uh, transportation uh, sector mainly for heavy duty today because um, uh, still the same uh, still the same logic and the same framework decarbonization is necessary there is no option but to decarbonize and then you want to go zero emission mobility or in mobility sector you have the choice between battery and hydrogen battery electric and hydrogen electric and uh, when we're talking about heavy duty hydrogen takes all its um, technology competitive advantage because you can ensure longer autonomy and the fast refueling uh, refueling time for these kind of vehicles. So I do see some first cases in, in heavy duty and, and some cases in maritime starting to be emerged. However, as I said already, and I want to highlight, I really see this public and um, policy push towards, uh, towards hydrogen for the decommunization pathways. And I do believe to see even more projects I can support with private financing quite time soon. Great news. Thank you, Alena. It's a material world and it's really important to see where the profits are. So uh, moving uh, to the public policies and to the national strategies. Karsten, I have several questions to you from the audience. Uh, first one is on hydrogen colors. And I think it is really a debate which is developing worldwide. So we all want hydrogen. What are your thoughts on hydrogen from gas and CCS, blue and gray, in the short term? It is the first question. And the second one is on the national strategies. Uh, how can countries interested in hydrogen think about their adapting their existing resources to develop their hydrogen capabilities? Right, I start with the with the colors. In fact, we, we looked into those as well for all the countries that have actually dealt with it more in depth. And you may you may differentiate two time frames, the timeline until 2030 and the longer term until say mid of the century. And say for the next decade, most of the countries really we looked at uh, do include gray as well as green, as well as blue hydrogen. So they all say we have to take whatever we can get to make use of the infrastructure. And I think that makes sense in this sense of the, the market building. For the longer term, in fact, that's a little bit more split. Almost all of the countries and strategies we looked in uh, do call for green hydrogen. And say half of them would also include blue hydrogen as part of a long-term solution. So there's really differences a little bit between uh, Europe and Asia, but also within Europe, there's, there's still differences that you can make up at the moment. Just a word on the demand side, if I may, on the policy mix as the discussion we had. Um, I think it is really crucial uh, to build the different blocks together and by that, uh, making the difference as small as we can by introducing CO2 prices as we do in these days in, in many countries, in all sectors, and building on that with subsidy schemes in the first place and maybe quota solutions or other solutions where the product place a uh, product price uh, will finance really in the end the product and this mixture might end up uh, in, in bridging all the gap in Germany with our own hydrogen strategy a part of the seven billion we want to spend on hydrogen in the next years to come will be devoted uh, for so-called contracts for difference. That's one uh, policy instrument that tries to bridge the gap between the CO2 price and then the green hydrogen price. So these are pilot projects where we try to find out how much subsidy will be really needed uh, to bring the things into the markets. Um, what can the countries bring in and what does that do also with corporations maybe in the end? As of course, not every country is in the place to produce its hydrogen for itself. Some countries have uh, very interesting technologies. Others have the uh, sun and the wind that might be used for, for uh, green hydrogen. 
And out of these different starting points, I think um, there are very important uh, chances for further cooperations, as we see between Australia and Japan or South Korea, as we see between Germany and Morocco, uh, as we see between Netherlands and Portugal in these days. So these are bilateral cooperations in the first place. And my personal guess would be we will stay with these bilateral cooperations for quite some while, as it will take time that we see a global commodity market for hydrogen that needs big quantities. Um, I would wish so. And I think the vision is having this global commodity market for hydrogen or hydrogen-based derivatives, but it will take a little bit. And in this time in between, there's a lot of room for cooperation between different countries and technology partners. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten. And um, I will move to Muraki san We have two questions for you. And the first one I think uh, is extremely important. It's on the marginal costs of production and how they could be drawn down. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, Alona has already elaborated uh, on the scaling up, yeah, but also maybe you see any additional uh, specific uh, steps for different technologies. And the second question is on the uh, talk about public safety and acceptability elements. Both hydrogen and its derivatives like ammonia, uh, they cause a lot of uh, doubts and concerns among the public, not in my backyard and so on. So what do you think, how should the hydrogen community address to these questions? Okay, thank you, Tatiana. And the first question and uh, the cost uh, reduction. Uh, the renewable the hydrogen cost reduction is very important and uh, particularly the cost reduction in the hydrogen production by electrolyzers. I think as the EU uh, vision says that the target of the hydrogen production cost from renewable is 0.7 to 1.5 euros per kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, this is a final target but I don't think that it can be achieved uh, tomorrow. So we need to have the step-by-step -step approaches uh, from the production through the market. In case of our project of ammonia, we are trying to develop the scalable uh, market firstly or initially using uh, brew ammonia. It's more cost-effective. So market entry will be achieved by supplied by the uh, brew ammonia a and the scalable market can drive the cost reduction of the, the green hydrogen and uh, and the green ammonia for instance in australia there are several projects one of those projects has a plan to develop 26 gigawatt of the renewable resources it's a uh, solar and wind power to produce uh, hydrogen and ammonia. It's a three-step approach. But the final goal, I think that cost will be more comparable with the uh, blue hydrogen and the blue ammonia. However, through this effort, not only the market, I think the, the government policy and government regulatory framework we need to support the, the, the trading of the carbon-free uh, hydrogen ammonia uh, with some incentives or, or, or the regulations or, or carbon uh, offset or carbon pricing or carbon credit. So we will start a discussion, already started discussions within the Japanese government and Japanese industry and also we are trying to, to develop the discussions with Australian uh, partners in this uh, regard. So those kind of different efforts can reduce the cost of the green products to be competitive in the market. And the, the safety issue is very, very important. And the hydrogen safety and ammonia safety is different. And hydrogen is more explosive uh, product. So I think it's the, we need to, yeah, but it's not dangerous. So we already have safety standard, but 
Uh, the one thing we have to do is education to the public and community and uh, how to handle the hydrogen. If we properly handle the hydrogen in those ways, uh, it's not dangerous. The safety is secure. In case of ammonia, it's not, it's flammable, but it's not really explosive, but it's a toxic material. So what we are planning is not using the ammonia in the public area. In the controlled area with the train uh, operators like a power generation uh, plant and, uh, and the, the facilities and, and, and works. Uh, and the, the safety standard of ammonia already established in the chemical industries and even in the power industry because they use ammonia for the denox uh, agent. So safety standard is there. So how to handle those products in the market, what kind of market, and how to, to educate the public. That's a key point. Thank you so much, Moraki-san. Uh, we have uh, another question uh, to our panel, and I would ask Alan and Emmanuel to take it. Uh, it's about the role of hydrogen in the uh, seasonal storage. So to what extent do you consider that hydrogen transshipment from one hemisphere to another can effectively address seasonal energy demand peaks as an alternative to seasonal storage uh, in one hemisphere? So, Alan, how do you think? Well, I think in principle it can. Um, if you think about the LNG industry, there's just a massive amount of natural gas in those ships being transshipped back and forth. And most countries don't have to have more than a few weeks of supply to supplement any shortage on the ships. But I think the costs of future liquefied hydrogen ships will be higher than the cost of LNG ships. And probably the tonnage of the liquefied material it will be significantly smaller on a liquefied hydrogen ship. So I think in principle it can, but it's possibly going to be more cost effective to do your storage onshore in the destination countries. Thank you, Alan. Emmanuel, uh, would you add to that? I think part of the answer was given by Muraki-san uh, when introducing the merits of ammonia. Um, uh, on top of that, um, we have now the experience of the maritime sector on the use of ammonia. And I think this will be the game changer in the years to come. At any case, uh, as I pointed, uh, pointed out, the, the brand of hydrogen is energy storage. So uh, at the end of the day, we will have a kind of commoditization of hydrogen or hydrogen carriers. And this uh, will resolve the issue by uh, by itself. The, the 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 final criterion is always the society need to decarbonize, and that will have uh, uh, at the most cost effective way. And I think global hydrogen supply in that context could be cost effective. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. So we are approaching to the final stage of our session, and uh, I would like to ask all our panelists to make one minute final statement, but also to answer a very tricky question, which was in the description of our session, uh, which sounds the following way. Will clean hydrogen be less than 4% or more than 10% of the global energy mix by 2040? What do you think? Your personal assessment. So, Emmanuel, uh, let's start with you as you were the first to open this. <laughs> you put all the difficult stuff to me for today. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I hope that we will be all around by 2030 or 2040, as you said. And uh, I would bet for uh, the 10% option. Uh, provided that the decarbonization targets and the appetite to achieve uh, the temperature control over the globe is as today. And um, yeah, let me, uh, let me summarize a little bit uh, our standpoint uh, from an industrial point of view. Uh, you know, we are bringing up technologies 
to uh, meet societal demands. This is our credo. So we have, uh, and the industry as a whole has responded to deliver um, technologies to decarbonization and more specifically to the green and the blue hydrogen utilization. To this end, the industry as a technology provider in general is doing the part of the, do of the deal. There is the other part, which is the politicians and the policymakers who have to bring up uh, the means to pave the way, to facilitate the first movers. I'm extremely happy with, uh, with what Alena is doing in, in France. I will catch up with her and discuss a little bit more how we put together some initiatives, which, however, for the time being, need the public support as every first mover attempt, as it is, as uh, the stories of renewable has been written in the power sector as today. So with a bit of government support, following the societal changes, uh, challenges on decarbonization, I think we will make it and uh, the industry will make it happen. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Manuel. Great. Alan, so what is your bet? Below 4% or above 10% by 2040? Well, let me take as a given assumption, as Emmanuel did, that um, the determination globally to decarbonize will continue and the governments will have policies that support that. Uh, nevertheless, I think the uptake in the early years through this decade, through the build of demand of hydrogen and ammonia will be slower than we're all hoping, but it's then gonna hit some sort of acceleration just like we saw with solar electricity. And probably by 2040, we'll look back and say, my gosh, it's just huge. I think that it'll be significantly more than 10%, maybe 15% of final energy delivered, but we won't see that for quite some time. But when we look back, we'll say, gosh, it happened very fast. So I would encourage everybody to be very, very ambitious, but stay patient. Great, thank you, Alan. Alena, up to you. Yeah, during my years in academia, while uh, searching on hydrogen for the energy transition, uh, I wrote, you guess, quite a number of reports. And depending on the source, you can find everything for 1% to 50% of hydrogen contributing to the final energy demand. Uh, the number I like to reference to is around 80%, which is the number stated by uh, Industrial Coalition Hydrogen Council. Um, I've contributed to uh, some of their first studies. So, however, I absolutely align with Emmanuel and Alan. It's all about our ambition uh, to the energy transition success and uh, to uh, what kind of temperature we want to restrict um, the increase in the average global temperature. Um, for my final comment, uh, and Emmanuel, I will be more than happy to discuss what projects we can support together with you. The ecosystem is here. The stars of uh, policy concern are and technology readiness and uh, good ideas is emerging and is here. And uh, my message is to the project developers um, from solar and wind who has already succeeded this uh, transition uh, in the decarbonization of the energy production. Have a close look on hydrogen. Please do uh, develop some good hydrogen projects and uh, public funds are there available and private funds as the one I'm uh, managing is there also to help. Thank you, Alona. Karsten, over to you. Well, Tatiana, I, I'd wish Ellen is right, but uh, at the moment I still fear that we won't be that much above 10% in 2040, although we should if we would really take our targets or policy targets serious. Uh, but in fact, I believe that the speed will increase. We see the rising governmental commitment, as I said, in the, in the strategies. But now we have to turn from the debate about targets and colors, really about policy instruments and implementing and making use of hydrogen and its derivatives. And as I said, there's a lot of chances uh, for further cooperation. And this is something that makes me quite happy um, for the markets, also for an organization like the World Energy Council, because I think international cooperation, uh, if that is needed, the council could be a place to really facilitate this dialogue. And um, for myself, we will work uh, for the next two years um, with Australia as BDI on examining 
how the value chain also for long distance exports imports could look like. I'm looking forward uh, to do so uh, with German government and maybe Australian partners then on the other side to really showcase that this is not just a vision that but this will come true. Great, thank you, Karsten. Uh, Murake-san, yeah. full summary. <laughs> okay, uh, very quickly. And uh, four percent is possible, and uh, and uh, the ten percent is challenge. But uh, I think it's it's also possible. And in Japan, uh, we are planning to use an ammonia in the power generation to produce uh, about two to three percent of the the total power generation by 2030, including the other uh, hydrogen use in a different market. I think that by 2040, that will be. The more than 10 percent and uh, i think it's the global market particularly the power generation industrial and maritime market those uh, penetrations in those market can possibly achieve the 10 percent in the energy mix by 2040 hydrogen and ammonia and other energy hydrogen energy carriers and, and but uh we are now in the, in the, in the time of the challenge Yes, indeed. Thank you, Murakisan. And uh, I would like to call all uh, everybody who is watching this panel, please join me in thanking our panelists. I think that was an extremely interesting and inspiring discussion. So actually, we have now, according to our speakers, all the components for the real hydrogen breakthrough. We have the ecosystem in, uh, evolving, we have the new technologies, we have the governmental support, we have huge public interest in decarbonization, which wasn't there uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And we have the interest from the investors, from the financial society. So it seems that this time hydrogen will be able to make the difference, to make this dramatic change in the global energy mix. And I hope that uh, in 20 years, by 2040, we will see something above 10% of hydrogen in the global energy mix. And keep tuned. I'm sure there will be a lot of new interesting developments in the hydrogen world. Thank you for being with us. And thanks to all panelists for sharing their amazing expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for an excellent overview with regard to hydrogen. Uh, again, my quick notes were that I think it, you know, it was a privilege potentially uh, to witness the start of a hydrogen age. I think the panelists were realistic in terms of some of the opportunities, but also some of the challenges as we go forward. And as we heard at the end from Tatiana in her summary, the expectation that potentially hydrogen can be 10% part of the energy mix by 2040. I also heard a, an excellent phrase that I, I've written down, which is that hydrogen offers, offers us the opportunity to address the tyranny of distance when we think about renewables. And this links to hydrogen's great value in the context of renewable storage within hydrogen and how that can be used and how we'll see that differently over the course of the next number of years. Tatiana and panel, thank you very much indeed for uh, an excellent discussion. And as I say, the start of a hydrogen age.